Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And these are probably fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, if you've been a part of a church for some time, if you've been a believer for a while, these verses may be very familiar to you. I want to talk with you about this subject this morning, worship as a lifestyle. We're in a series on Sunday mornings, a series that concludes today. And we've been talking about what it means to worship God. We've been talking about what it means to, to learn how to grow deeper in our understanding of worship and deeper in our experience of prayer. Uh, the series Connect, 40 Days of Passionate Worship. It's been more than a sermon series. It really has been a journey that we've walked through together as the body of Christ. Because it includes sermons on Sunday morning. It includes the Sunday school lessons we've been a part of. It includes personal devotions throughout the week as well as family devotions. And it all culminates here this Sunday as we consider what the Word of God says about how we ought to live our lives according to the Word as worship each and every day. You do realize we come to worship on Sunday, but Sunday worship is just an expression, an overflow of what God has been doing in our lives all week long. So worship is not just a moment in time, it is a life that we live. I want to remind you of a few of the uh, guiding principles that we've established throughout this series. First one is worship is a lifestyle, not an event. Worship is a lifestyle, not an event. In other words, worship is a life I live, not a service I attend. And so every day my life ought to be centered around Jesus Christ. And when I live for Him at the job, or in the classroom, or on the ball field, or you name it, that is an act of worship to the Lord. Worship is not a service I attend, it's a life I live. And when I come to worship on Sundays, I come to gather with the saints of God, with believers in Jesus Christ. I come together to see friends and family and other church members. This is an overflow of what God's been doing in my life all week long. Worship is a lifestyle, not an event. The second guiding principle is this. Worship is about God's glory, not my preferences. Worship is about God's glory, not my preferences. In, in other words, I might have a favorite style of music, or I might have a favorite song, or I might have a favorite whatever, but in the end, it really doesn't matter what I think. It's about what God thinks. That is what's most important. And so many times we get caught up in the way someone sings a song, or the style of music, or the way someone dresses, that we distract from the fact that it's not about what we want or we desire. It's not about my preferences. It's about God and His glory. And it might come as a surprise to you to realize that God doesn't have a favorite type of music. You want to know what God's favorite type of music is? God seeks those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. He's not concerned about the style. He wants the substance that's based on the Word of God and the source, the heart of a true worshiper. That's what God is looking for. Uh, the third guiding principle. Worship is a spiritual experience, not an outward show. When we come to church, you realize this is different than any other public gathering you'll ever attend. You realize that? This is different than going to a movie theater to watch a show. It's different than going to the ball field to watch a game. It's different than going to a playhouse to watch a play. This is a spiritual experience. God is concerned about what's happening in your heart, in your life, in my heart, in my life, as we're drawn closer to Him each and every day. And an outflow of that is what happens here on Sunday. So the truth is, though, we come to church, and more often than not, we're, we're worried about the person sitting next to us and what they think, even more than what God thinks. Worship is a spiritual experience, not an outward show. And then fourth and finally, worship is about what I put into it, not what I get out of it. Now, we've probably all been guilty before of walking away from church and saying, man, I just, I didn't get much out of it today. I didn't get much out of that song, or I didn't get much out of that sermon, or I didn't get much of that lesson, or that, that Sunday school. Man, even the donuts, they just didn't taste good today, you know? You ever had one of those days? But if we switch our perspective... And if we begin to understand that worship is not about what I get, 
when I come to church, but it's about what I give. We've said every Sunday, when you back the truck up on Sundays, you're backing the truck up full, ready to bring something to God. And I promise when you bring something and offer it to him, he'll fill the truck back up. He'll continue to bless you. But you're not walking into this place saying, hey, God, remember, it's all about me. I hope that you can bless me today. No, you're reminding yourself and others that it's all about him. It's not about what I get out of it. It's about what I put into it. And I've come today to worship God because he's worthy. You know what? God is worthy of worship even on the days you don't feel like worshiping. We all have those days. He's worthy of worship even in the valleys. As much as he is on the mountain, God is worthy of worship. And so we come to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. As we think about this subject, worship as a lifestyle. Read with me Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. As Paul writes to the Roman church, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Remember, the power is in the perfect word of God. God's word has the power to change our lives. If you'll remember, we've said that worship is our response to what we value most. That's our definition of worship. Worship is my response to what I value most. And so if I value God the most, I'll worship him and it will show in the way I live. Whatever you value will be evidenced in the way you spend your time and the way you live your life. You, you realize that, right? And you can't say that you value God if you don't spend time with him and you don't live your life for him. Now, how many of you, by a show of hands, let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you own what they call a smartphone? Let me see your hands. Raise them up real high, real high. Okay, you own a smartphone. How many of you own a dumb phone? Let me see. Anybody? Okay, all right. How many of you think your smartphone is making you dumb? Let me see your hands. Yes, yes, I know that feeling. I know that feeling. But, you know, th this, this little, I own a smartphone. Maybe you've heard of it before. It's called an iPhone. You, you ever heard of that before? I own an iPhone. And uh, this thing is a neat little device, a great little invention, right? There's all sorts of stuff you can do. Uh, I can check email. I can keep up with my contacts. I've got many of your cell phones in here. I can give you a call. I can uh, check Twitter or if I'm on Facebook, I can check Facebook. I can search all sorts of stuff. I have access to, to Wikipedia if I have questions about events or Google. You can answer some questions right here at my fingertips. There's all sorts of things. And I love the, um, the, the app that I have that's a reminder app. You know, I have an app called AnyDo, and it reminds me of things that I, oh, you, you can talk on the phone with this thing too. Do you know that? Pretty cool, right? I have an app that helps me remember things. And, and the truth is this, I have a really bad memory. I think I've told you this before, but I can't remember if I have, so I'm telling you again. I have a really bad memory. I, I really do. I don't remember much. Now, if it's something big, like, like uh, there's an event coming up, I typically don't forget those things. But if somebody comes up to me on Sunday and says, hey, preacher, can you do this? I'm typically forgetting before I, before I hit the office what you've asked me to do. That's why if you come up to me on Sundays, I'll look at you and say, it's Sunday. I'm not going to remember we talked today. Will you please call me or email me or send me a text or call my assistant? Let me know so I don't drop the ball. This is a pretty neat little uh, gadget because I can even set an event on the calendar and I can set it to remind me 15 minutes ahead of the event so I don't hopefully I don't forget as much as I might would pretty neat sometimes I wonder if these things make our lives more complicated or if they make them more simple we'll talk about that a little bit as we study Psalm 119 tonight but I began to think the other day I wonder what it'd be like if in my head I had this uh, I had this system where every day I could give myself a reminder. Every moment of every day, it'd pop in my head 15 minutes before I woke up or right as I awoke and said, worship God today. Every moment of every day, in this moment, worship God. At this instance, worship God. In traffic on Russell Parkway or Watson Boulevard, worship God. God forbid you have to drive through Atlanta. Worship God. I think, I think my life would be better 
I'd be a better child of God. I'd be a better follower of Jesus if I could remind myself of that every moment of every day. But the Bible does just that. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 remind us every moment of every day in every instance of our lives, worship God. Worship is an everyday lifestyle. It's something we do every moment of the day. But you can't do it if your heart's not in the right place. You can't do it if your mind is focused on the wrong things. And so, I know I need that. I thought maybe you might need that too. The first thing I notice here in this text of Scripture, if worship is a lifestyle, number one, notice this, it's a lifestyle of personal sacrifice. A lifestyle of personal sacrifice. We're called to sacrifice each and every day. Now look at what the text says once again. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The first thing we notice here in this text is Paul is taking a very urgent tone. This is serious, it's important, this is tough stuff, and it's important for you and for me to know, to hear, and to understand. Notice first the plea from Paul. He says, our lives should be marked by personal sacrifice. Now notice he says, I appeal to you. The word appeal there is very interesting in the original language. It means to exhort, to encourage. It's also used when a general would go exhort or encourage his troops before he went into battle. So this is no weak request on the part of Paul. This is a strong and serious encouragement. He's not saying, hey, I wish you would consider this. He's saying, make this a priority. I'm begging you to pay attention every moment of every day. Sacrifice yourself before God. The plea from Paul, it's very urgent. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. You, you know, I've said this before, but I hope you remember. Anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, ask yourself the question, what's it there for? Because the word refers back to something that has been said. Now, Paul, when he writes his letters, he has two sections in his letters. One is a teaching section, the other is application. One is doctrine, the other is duty. And so now, chapter 12 is a significant shift. He's transitioning from all the doctrine in chapters 1 through 11. And in 12 to 16, he's telling you, this is how you live in light of what you've learned. The church ought to be the same way. Your life ought to be the same way. My life ought to be the same way. Not just what I know, but how I live my life. That's what matters. In light of eternity. And so Paul has been teaching about some really amazing things. The God who created the universe who's re revealed himself to mankind. How sin is devastating and separates us from God. But how God loved us even while we were sinners. And Christ came to die for us and to pay our debt on the cross so that we can have a relationship with him. And now as a result we're justified not by works but we're justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's called grace. This is the kind of stuff that Paul's saying. And because of that Romans chapter 8 tells us that now we have within us the Holy Spirit of God who communicates to the Father in such a way we can't even begin to imagine the Bible says with groanings that cannot be uttered so that as a child of God I can say no matter what happens to me no matter what I face no matter what I encounter Romans 8 28 it's all going to work out for good according to those who love the Lord Paul is talking about some pretty incredible stuff and he says I appeal to you therefore because of all of this that I've taught you God's grace his rescue and redemption. The spirit of God that dwells inside of you. The promise of the glory that is to come. Because of all this, this is what I'm asking. He says, I appeal to you, notice this now, on the mercies of God. Not based upon the practicality of the situation. Not based upon a promise that you'll never have a bad life and you'll never face a problem. But, I, but based upon what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, you must consider living for him. That, that's what Paul's saying. I appeal to you, therefore, based on the mercies of God. What's the greatest motivation you and I have for following Jesus? It is what he's done for us on the cross. It's his mercy. You know what mercy is, right? Mercy is when God withholds punishment from those who deserve it. That is mercy. Grace is when God gives blessings, good things, to those who don't deserve it. So Paul says, based on God's mercy, based on the fact that as a child of God, I'm not going to hell, I'm going to heaven. I ought to live in this way. 
Paul is saying this is, this is the life of personal sacrifice, the plea from Paul. But notice what he's asking. This is the presentation to God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, based on the mercies of God. Here it is. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The presentation to God. The word present there comes from two words in the Greek. To place and beside. So literally, it refers to the priests who would take the lamb and slaughter the lamb, shedding its blood, placing it on the altar so that it might be consumed with fire. That is, the, the word harkens back to the Old Testament sacrificial system to present your life on the altar before God. But wait a second. How can I live for God if he's asking me to sacrifice myself? Well, there's a big difference. Because Christ, the Lamb, was slain once and for all. God no longer requires a blood sacrifice. That debt's been paid in full. So what is God asking of me? Present your bodies. Bodies means everything that you are. Your mind, your heart, your soul, everything. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You see, in the Old Testament, they didn't know anything about a living sacrifice. Those sacrifices were slaughtered and consumed. But what Paul is saying is this, and this is profound. You and I are called to be living sacrifices. We are alive to Christ and we are dead to self and to sin. We're alive to the things of God, the word of God, but we are dead to the things of this world. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. Paul says, I crucify the flesh daily. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I who lives, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is saying this. Every moment of the day, I am dead to my own wants and wishes, and I'm alive because the Holy Spirit of God dwells within me, and I can seek to honor him and bring him glory. It is an amazing thing. You realize if you are dead to self, no one can offend you or hurt your feelings. If you're dead to self, no circumstance is going to bring you down. If you're dead to self, you're not living for your own wants. You're living for Jesus. And so here I am, a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice, alive but dead to the old Jim. Alive to Jesus Christ in my life. It's a profound thought. A powerful picture. I'm going to share something with you. I shared this with the preteens. Just a few weeks back. In fact, this message will be very familiar to our preteen group. I shared this principle with our students last Wednesday night. I'm going to share a principle with you today. If you don't hear anything else I've said, if you don't remember anything else we've talked about today, this is the principle I want to share with you. And I can promise this principle will change your life. If you put this into practice every moment of every single day, it will change everything. This, this quote is not original to me, okay? I heard it when I was in seminary, and he heard it from somebody else who heard it from somebody else. But this is what it says. It's very powerful. In every heart, there's a throne and there's a cross. And either self is on the throne and Christ is on the cross, or Christ is on the throne and self is on the cross. Now think about that. I, I want you to get the picture. I'm, I'm going to borrow a stool here for a second. This, will, this stool will be a picture, Okay. It's just an image, but it will be a picture of a throne. I know it looks like a throne to you, but uh, this will be the picture of the throne. Imagine that this stage right here is your heart, your life and my life. In every heart, there's a throne. Who sits on the throne? The king sits on the throne, right? Whoever's in charge is on the throne in control. In every heart, there's a throne and there's a cross. Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, but he didn't stay on the cross, did he? He was placed in a borrowed tomb. He rose again on the third day. Jesus Christ lives today. So imagine this is your heart and my heart. And in every heart, everyone has a throne and everyone has a cross. And either self is on the throne and Christ is on the cross, or Christ is on the throne and self is on the cross. And let me remind you, there's no room for two people on this throne. There's only room for one. And so I have to decide, when I'm living my life according to my own wants and wishes, you know what that means. I'm the king. I'm in charge. But what am I saying to Jesus? You might as well be dead. Dead to me. Still on the cross. Because I'm not listening to what you have to say. I'm in charge. But when each and every day I do what Jesus commanded me to do, deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him 
here's what I say. I recognize that he deserves the throne. He's the king. He's Lord. He's the boss. He's in charge. And so I have to choose. When I get up off that throne, I'm saying I'm dead to self. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to all my wants and wishes. And I'm saying that Jesus Christ is in control. It's not about me. It's all about him. He's the king. I'm going to tell you something. If you apply this principle in every area of your life, you will be forever changed. It'll change the way you talk to your wife or the way you treat your husband. It'll change the way you parent your children. It'll change the way you approach the Word of God. It'll change the way you work at your job. It'll change the way you share Jesus with others. It'll change the way, young people, the way you act at school. If I live my life with Jesus Christ on the throne, then I'm recognizing I'm not living for me. I'm living for Him. I'm not the boss. He is Lord. He's in control. That's a life of personal sacrifice. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. Second, we notice right here in this text, very interesting, which is your spiritual worship. Interesting phrase. It's a lifestyle of faithful service. A lifestyle of faithful service. So, but I want you to understand something. Until you've sacrificed yourself, died to self, you can't serve God. It's all an effort of the flesh. But now, as a result, Paul says, this is your spiritual worship. Some of your translations say, this is your reasonable service. Well, what does that mean? First of all, there's a, re, a personal accountability that's expressed. Personal accountability. How does he reference this now? It is, look at that word, you might want to circle it in your Bible, your spiritual worship. The preacher can't do this for you. Your spouse can't do this for you. Your Sunday school teacher can't do this for you. This is your responsibility. If you are not as close to God as you've ever been, whose fault is that? It's not his fault. He never moved. If I'm not as close to God as I've ever been, it's my fault. I have the responsibility for my own spiritual growth, and you do as well. We're called to grow as children of God. There's a personal accountability expressed. Now, in the Scriptures, I want you to understand something. There's, there's a powerful principle. The Bible tells us we're to work out what God works in. The, the Christian life is an incredible balance of God's work in me and God's work through me. God has done a great work in me. He saved me. He redeemed me. He's changed me and transformed me. That work is done, but he's still doing a great work through me, the work of sanctification, the work of spiritual growth, and this is what he's calling us to do. We're to work out what God works in. So in the Christian life, it's not all of him and none of me where I just sit back and make sure that he handles everything, but it's not all of me and none of him. We work together, the Spirit of God, inside of us. Growing as believers in Jesus Christ. That's our personal accountability. But notice this. There's a reasonable activity expected. Look at what it says. Your spiritual worship. Now, some translations say your reasonable service. Which is it? It's both. And I want you to know why. In the Old and New Testament, the word worship and the word service are basically inseparable. Do you notice that? We've separated them today because we have two different words. And so we do worship and we do service. But in the Bible, you know those words are basically inseparable. The word for spiritual service is the word for spiritual worship. So when I'm serving God in the nursery changing diapers, that is worship. It might not feel like it or smell like it. But that's worship. When I preach, it's worship. When I give, it's worship. It is your spiritual worship, your reasonable activity. So, as a child of God, when I've done everything for the Lord Jesus Christ that he asks, you know what we've done? We've done the duty of a servant. Luke chapter 17 tells us very clearly. The servant comes in and continues to serve. I'm an unworthy servant. I'm only done my duty. This is your spiritual Worship every moment of every day. We need, as children of God, a life of faithful service, a life of personal sacrifice. 
There's a story of uh, Queen Mary who used to love to visit Scotland. She loved Scotland so much because Scotland loved her, and she would just walk through the crowds. It made the, the soldiers in her guard very nervous. But one day she walked a little farther than normal. The guards were right there with her, but then they noticed there was rain coming very quickly. The clouds had become dark. There was no way to get back to where they needed to be so they could be protected from the rain. So she just kept walking and then walked up to a small little home and knocked on the door. She looked at the lady and the lady didn't recognize it, it was the queen. The lady said, you know, I, the queen said to the lady, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to make it home before we get caught in this rain. Do you mind if I borrow an umbrella? Well, the lady, not recognizing the queen, thought for a moment, I'm not going to give a stranger my best umbrella. She, she looked behind the door and she found an umbrella that she intended to throw away. Had a couple rips in it, one of the broken ribs, and she reached back there and gave the queen that umbrella. The queen said, thank you very much, and went on her way. And the next day, the lady heard another knock at the door. She walked to the door, and it was the captain of the royal guard who showed up to deliver this torn, tattered, broken umbrella to this lady. Immediately, when she saw the soldier she realized what had happened. She began to weep. She began to sob uncontrollably. And here's what she said. Oh, what an opportunity I missed. I didn't give the queen my very best. And I wonder, as believers in Jesus Christ, we will stand before him one day and give an account. And I wonder how many of us will be heartbroken when we say those same words. I didn't give the king my very best. A life of faithful service. This is your spiritual worship. Personal sacrifice, faithful service, and number three, a lifestyle of spiritual strength. A lifestyle of spiritual strength. What does it mean to grow strong as a child of God? A lifestyle of spiritual strength. Let's look again at verse two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That is God's will. And so we're to be, the Bible tells us, in the world, but not of the world. What does that mean? Well, there, there's a balance. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. We're to be God's children, His ambassadors here in this world, but we're not to be conformed to the, to the mold and the standards of this world. The best way I know how to describe it is this. It's like a boat in water. The boat is in the water. It's intended to float. That is what it's made to do. But when the water gets in the boat, you're sunk. The same thing is true as a Christian. We are created not to be isolated or insulated from the world, but to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. But if the world gets in us, we're sunk. And so we as believers in Jesus Christ are called to impact our community, our nation and world. Oh, preacher, you don't understand this world's an awful place. It's so dark. Yes, it is. That's why we are the light of the world. We're called to make a difference and impact for him. A couple of things I want you to notice here. First of all, the danger of being conformed to this world. The danger of being conformed to the world. Notice what the text says here. Do not be conformed to this world. It's a command. It's a warning. Don't be conformed to the world. Here the Bible's telling us, don't follow after the patterns. Don't follow after the desires. Don't follow after the practices of those who don't know Jesus. Our life will be different if we come to know Christ. The word conformed is a very powerful word. It gives the idea of pressure from the outside that pushes in. How many of you played with Play-Doh growing up? Anybody? How many tasted Play-Doh? All right, be honest. I know you did. Salty, isn't it? Yeah. I wouldn't know, but somebody told me. We got our kids the Play-Doh factory. Play-Doh factory. All kinds of great stuff. In fact... This toy has long since made a run to goodwill, but we had, we had a Play-Doh ice cream shop where you had a little cone, and you could get your scoops of ice cream, and you could push the Play-Doh down in there and turn this thing, and it would make colorful sprinkles that would end up pushed down into your carpet, impossible ever, ever to get out. And we'd take that Play-Doh, and we'd put it in there, and we'd push the button, and, and you'd turn it, and all this stuff would come out. And this is the picture. God is saying the world can be kind of like a Play-Doh factory, and we don't need to let our lives be forced into their mold. We need to break the mold for Jesus. And the truth is sometimes we feel the pressure from the out, the outside coming in on us. 
And we need to make sure that we're strong, stand firm. Do not be conformed to this world. Next, notice this. So the danger of being conformed to the world. But secondly, the, the duty of being transformed by Christ. The duty of being transformed by Christ. Do not be conformed to this world. But what does it say? But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, where the word conformed is from the outside in, the word transformed is from the inside out. It's a change of heart that leads to a change in life. You know the word transformed in the Greek. You know Greek. Did you know that you knew Greek? You do. The word is metamorpho. You know what that is, right? Metamorphosis. You've heard that word. What is metamorphosis? Metamorphosis is a change of nature that leads to a change in form that leads to a change in action from the caterpillar to the butterfly, a transformation. So what does the Bible say we ought to be? We ought to be transformed, a change in nature through the Spirit of God in us that leads to a change in form. We're no longer who we were. That leads to a change of action. I no longer live like I used to live because now Jesus dwells in me and he is on the throne. That's what it means to be transformed. To be transformed how? By the renewal of your mind. What does that mean? Renewing your mind is a daily task for the Christian and it comes through reading the word and through prayer. That's what it means. So if I'm supposed to be transformed by renewing my mind, I can't be transformed if I can't be renewed, and I can't be renewed if I'm not in the Word and in prayer. If I'm not gathering together with other believers, if I'm not a part of a small group Sunday school class, if I'm missing out on that, then I won't be the child of God that I need to be. I need to grow each and every day as a child of God, growing in my relationship with the Lord. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Why? So that you may know and prove what is God's will for your life. The good, acceptable, and perfect will. You have no idea how many people come to me and say, Preacher, I just want to know God's will for my life. You do. Yeah, I just want to know God's will. What are you going to do if you know God's will? Oh, Preacher, if I know God's will, I'm going to obey God's will. You really want to know God's will? I do. Okay. Open your Bible. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God, the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. That it's God's will for your life. No, that's not what I mean. I want to know how to make this decision or what course should I follow. Hey, you walk with a renewed mind, informed by the Spirit of God, saturated in the Word, and He will show you every single step of the way. He will. You want to be transformed, you must be in the Word. We're transformed. You know, the Bible uses this phrase in other places. We are washed by the water of the Word. We're renewed every day. Renewed every single day. I heard a story of a lady who went to her preacher one day and said, I'm really struggling with this. I want, to, I want to worship God every day in my life. I want to be renewed. I want to be transformed, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know what it means. Could you tell me in a word, what does it mean to be completely devoted to Christ? What does it mean to worship Him faithfully? What does it mean to follow Him? What does it mean to live worship as a lifestyle? The preacher pulled out a blank sheet of paper and began to write on it. And he showed the lady something she never forgot. He said this. He said, if you really want to live for Jesus... If you really want to know what it means to be devoted to Christ, this is what it looks like. It is to take a blank sheet of paper and to write your name at the bottom and then to allow God to fill it in however He desires. It is to take a blank sheet of paper and put your name at the bottom and then to allow God to fill it in however He wants. Maybe you've been like me before. You have a whole list of desires and requests and preferences. And you bring it to God. And you say, okay, God, can you sign this for me? This is what it looks like. This is what it means. This is a picture of complete and total devotion. Worshiping God every day, whatever it takes, wherever He calls whenever it comes.